Support for this podcast and the following message come from Corient. Corient provides wealth management services centered around you. They focus on exceeding expectations, simplifying lives, and establishing legacies that last for generations. Leverage their exclusive network of experts to help achieve your personal and professional financial goals. As one of the largest integrated fee-only registered investment advisors in the U.S., Corient has experienced teams who can craft custom solutions designed to help you reach your financial goals, no matter how complex. Real wealth requires real solutions. Connect to a wealth advisor today at Corient.com. Com. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder, rape, and violence. This episode also contains discussion of domestic violence against both women and children. If you or someone you know is a victim of domestic abuse, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline. That's 800 799 7233. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cheat Sheet. Today, we're going to be doing a few quick updates on the murder of Laurel Jean Mitchell, as well as the Burger Chef murders and the murder of Bob Adair. In addition to that, we'll be going in depth on a few items in the University of Idaho murders and concluding with coverage of a new murder case that occurred in Indiana relatively recently. But before we get started, let's do a few quick housekeeping notes. Yes. So we heard you. We know you hate our old introduction with a passion and just note that we've changed it. We've made it shorter and some old episodes will go out with it because, you know, we don't really have time to just re-edit everything. To be, to be clear, when Anya says old episodes, she's not talking about reruns. No, they're old to us. They're not old to you. Sometimes we record things in advance, sometimes far in advance. Yes. Sometimes too far in advance. In addition to that, we want to note that, As we've mentioned, these cheat sheets are going to be our weekly roundups. They might not go out every week, but we're going to try to be relatively consistent with them. It's an opportunity to kind of go through, see if there have been any updates that we perhaps don't have time to do as their own episode. And we've also introduced a new format recently called Offbeat. And this is essentially our audio opinion column. It's a chance for Kevin and I to really tell you what we think about different issues in true crime. That's not going to be any sort of regularly scheduled thing. That'll be just something we do occasionally if we feel passionately about a topic. Right, Kevin? Right. And you know we're very dispassionate people, so that's not often. Uh, We're pretty much dead inside. Exactly. One more housekeeping item, and this is might be of interest of uh, for for some folks who listen to us pretty frequently on our Patreon for our five dollar level patrons, and also on Apple Podcasts for five dollars. There are ad free versions of our show. So if you don't like listening to our ads, then you have an option to join us as a subscriber on Patreon or Apple Podcasts for $5 a month. You're getting everything without any ads. And also I'll note uh, on the Patreon, you also get two live video episodes. Yeah, you can join us for an evening and we'll answer questions that you have and and chat about our show and chat about anything you want to chat about. So it's very informal. It's very informal. It's fun. I think people have a good time seeing, you know, usually I get kind of crazy and Kevin's kind of like, oh, gosh, Anya's going off the handle. So, you know, you can see that. So so it's very stressful for me, (laughs) but other people seem to enjoy it. So just check that out if you're interested. We put a lot of work into the show and It is our business, so if you don't like the ads, we understand, but then hopefully you'd be willing to pay a subscription fee to listen to our content. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The Cheat Sheet, Civil Cases and Cameras. To start off with just two quick updates into Indiana cases we've been covering. 
in the murder of Laurel Jean Mitchell, a teenager abducted from North Webster, Indiana, and murdered in 1975. Of course, there were two men recently charged in her murder, Fred Bandy and John Wayne Lehman. In Fred Bandy's case, for some reason, the August 24th hearing on motion to rule for show cause was canceled. So uh, th- that's just the most recent blip in, in the radar in those in that case. Now for Burger Chef, we have some exciting news. Uh, an article about the files we got from the FBI uh, appeared in the Franklin Daily Journal in a great article by uh, Noah Crenshaw. And that, that's kind of that's kind of special for us because the Franklin paper back in the 70s in its original coverage of the Burger Chef case did absolutely extraordinary work. You would think, of course, that the two papers from the big city, the Indianapolis papers, the Indianapolis Star and the Indianapolis News would have dominated the coverage. But actually, they seem to have pretty much the same sources and well, while, that, while there's a great deal in those papers that's valuable, the, the Franklin paper seemed to be getting their information from another source, most likely Ken York. And so they were able to have a really extra valuable perspective. Ken York was a state trooper, um, an Indiana State Police detective based in Johnson County. He is the grandfather of the robbery gang theory. So it was very exciting to talk to Noah and see this article come out. We'll include a link in our show notes. And we're going to be doing another episode talking about the files in the Burger Chef case very soon, very, very soon. And we've also had some requests for an episode that's basically a summary of the high points of the Burger Chef case. And we're going to work on that as well. The problem with this case is it's so complicated and there's so many different theories and possibilities and as unknowns to what, as to what may have happened that uh, people look and see that we've done. I don't know how many episodes on it, and they understandably want some sort of uh, an explainer. And we're going to try to do that soon. Absolutely. Now, we've just recently wrapped up our coverage of the murder of Bob Adair, a Brown County, Indiana man who was shot and killed by his neighbor, Randy Small. Small was just convicted of murder and sentenced to 60 years in the Indiana Department of Correction. But one thing that you may not realize about this case is that there's currently a a civil case ongoing. This can happen, you know, typically our focus is on the criminal case, right? Because that is where, you know, someone's going to be sentenced to prison or whatnot. But oftentimes if there's cause, there may also be a civil case where the family of the victim may be suing the perpetrator for um, killing their loved one. And and here in this case, it kind of makes sense that this would happen early on because Randy Small has never denied shooting Bob Adair. It's never been a question of like who did it. It was what was their self-defense here. So I think that opened him up to a civil lawsuit pretty quickly. And, the, and this uh, suit has been spearheaded by – Adair's daughter, Lauren Adair Horace, suing for damages. There are three counts. Count one involves the negligent use of firearms by defendant Small. Count two involves intentional actions of defendant Small. And count three involves extreme and outrageous conduct that goes beyond all possible bounds of decency. And so since they are saying, and the jury has agreed, that uh, Adair was killed as the result of the actions of Small. The Adair estate is asking for damages, uh, including but not limited to uh, the loss of Bob Adair's love and companionship, the cost of the funeral and burial expenses for Robert Adair, the costs of administrating Robert Adair's estate, Uh, as well as reasonable attorney's fees uh, involved in the civil action. I imagine that there could be a circumstance in this where the Adair family could actually get the land that the small family owned in Braun County, right? Yeah. If if the Adair family prevails in this suit and, and that's a way for them to pay it off, then that would be very ironic, given that Randy Small's unusual territorial nature over his land and his family's land that was kind of a alluded to in the trial ends up essentially 
getting it handed over to the Adairs. That would be an ironic twist to all It of would. It. it certainly would. Because uh, one thing is clear is that Randy Small, based on what we heard in court the other day, he doesn't really have a lot of financial resources. So if and when this suit goes against him, where would the money come from? Exactly. Perhaps in the property. But it's not even clear who owns the property. Yeah, it sounds like he may owe it own it with his siblings. So that um, obviously I'm just speculating here. There's any number of ways this could shake out. But just noting that even though the criminal case is done, this isn't over for Baba Dare's family. They want to be compensated for this loss and they're going after the small family for it. And that's understandable. So moving on to the University of Idaho murders, of course, this is the quadruple homicide that took the lives of Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Xander Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin, four University of Idaho students who were murdered in a house off campus. The person that police say did it is Brian Koberger, a Washington State University PhD student, formerly. And so... There's been a couple of developments here that I thought we could talk about. One involves the ongoing saga of debate about DNA, and the other one involves something that is near and dear to our heart, the media (laughs) and cameras. Why don't we start with the media first, because that's a lot less complicated and easier to understand. Yeah, we're we're media people. I'm a reporter, not a scientist, so I, I feel much more comfortable talking about this. So according to... Court TV, specifically reporting from Christine Coates of Scripps News, Boise, the camera hearing, there's going to be a hearing about cameras in the courtroom on Friday. We already told you about how the defense wants cameras out. They've said, get the cameras out of here. And the media, understandably, is saying, we don't want that to happen. So there's going to be a hearing about it on September 1st, which is Friday. So later today. Yeah. Yeah. So later, you're right. So later today. And and in addition to that, just as a heads up, on September 22nd, that's when they're going to talk about the defense's motion to dismiss the case. So that's that's been pushed that's off. That's still a ways off. That's a ways off, just in case you were wondering about that. Court TV and KXLY have both filed requests asking for the court to approve video and audio recording, as well as broadcasting at the September 1st hearing. Judge John Judge said no to broadcasting. Seemingly, I mean, it was kind of a confusing filing, but he circled denied for the broadcast section, but put X's next to both granted and denied. So I don't really know. I think he denied it and just indicated that there would be a pool offering, meaning one camera can film and everyone gets the footage. I want to look at the filing made by Wendy Olson, who is the lawyer for the media interveners. That's the group of media outlets that have basically filed into this saying, you know, here are some things we want for the press, which the press is allowed to do. Like they can have that representation and have a bit of a voice in a limited scope here. Because I I thought it was kind of interesting. The defense was very, what's the word, fiery? Or maybe I think a, a sympathetic view is fiery and an unsympathetic view would be over the top in its filing, accusing the media of doing this and that and focusing too much on their client. They're, you know, you've got cameras in his face. You're showing his face everywhere. You're not showing anything else. So that's bad. And I thought Wendy Olson's response was interesting. Mr. Kohlberger asked this court to remove cameras in the courtroom on the grounds that media have failed to heed the court's admonishment not to focus strictly on Mr. Kohlberger and to show a wide shot of the courtroom if they wish to continue filming court proceedings live. Mr. Kohlberger's subsequent citations to various media and social media publications do not support his position, however. For example, Mr. Kohlberger cites to a Fox News article that describes the court's statement to photographers and camera persons that they should not focus exclusively on Mr. Kohlberger. The Fox News story does not focus strictly on Mr. Kohlberger. However, It includes photos of A, Mr. Kohlberger and defense counsel Jay Logsdon entering the courtroom, B, 
defense counsel Ann Taylor and Elisa Massoff entering the courtroom, C, Latal County prosecuting attorney Bill Thompson in the courtroom, D, the murder victims, E, Mr. Koberger entering the courtroom, and F, a still photo from video of an Indiana law enforcement stop of the vehicle Mr. Koberger and his father were in on December 15, 2022. I mean, that's a pretty solid debunking of what the defense was claiming. The defense was saying you are focusing exclusively on our client and Olson pretty readily in the Fox News article that was cited by the defense is saying, no, <laughs> look at all these various pictures and images. Now, this this part got a little bit weird, but I'll read it anyway. In addition, although Mr. Koberger argues that he is entitled to defend himself against capital charges without cameras focused on his fly, that assertion misstates the role that courtroom camera coverage played in the X, formerly Twitter, social media post that appears at page three of his motion. No photographs or camera coverage focused on Mr. Koberger's fly. Rather, one random X user modified a photo showing Mr. Koberger and a deputy entering the courtroom by cropping it to a very small size, focused on his belt, and adding a reference to Mr. Koberger's fly. Even the cropped photo itself does not focus on Mr. Koberger's fly. I think this makes the defense look absolutely ridiculous. I'm sorry. I'm just going to be blunt there. And <laughs> I think that it's like this. I feel like in a situation where it's so high profile, a good defense is is like an actor, right? If you are a good actor, you know how to underplay. You know how to kind of be subtle in your performance. And then when you get loud, when you get passionate, when you get crazy, people are paying attention. But when you are, I think, an amateur actor overacts and gets really loud from the beginning and stays loud. And then when they keep getting it, just it's like, OK, you you lose the subtlety, you lose the nuance. And then when you're constantly at a fever pitch, it becomes less meaningful once you need once you really need to be at a fever pitch in terms of your emotional performance. And this strikes me as like accusing the media of they want Brian Koberger to be murdered. They want him to die. They're focused on his fly. And then the media is like, no, <laughs> it just I just think that makes them I, I think they should. I mean, I don't know. I would tone it down. Because once you go to that level of outrage, how do you top it in the trial or elsewhere? Are you going to just be in a permanent state of outrage about everything? If so, people would tend to start dismissing things you say that you really do want to call their attention to. And I think like there's absolutely reasons to have an issue with cameras in the courtroom. I thought in the defense motion around this, one thing that was really compelling was that we're having to hide our papers because the cameras might see them. So like that seems like an area where, OK, I could see that being an issue that could be disastrous for your defense. And perhaps you want the cameras to at least have some parameters where they can't possibly do that. Pick up what's on your desk. That's fine. And maybe just focus on that. But when you're when you're kind of like. It's like when somebody is arguing with you and they're, you know, maybe they're having a debate and they just kitchen sink you, like throwing everything but the kitchen sink in. I think that just actually undermines your own argument because it just make when you're being debunked, then it just sort of makes you look ridiculous and makes the other people look more reasonable in contrast. And I don't think you want that, especially not over a media debate. And also, certainly, I could imagine if Kohlberger or someone else sees this post on X referring to his fly, he might get upset or even outraged about it. Yeah, understandable. But we also have to keep in mind the so-called Barbara Streisand effect, which is when you criticize and complain about something, you call more attention to it. And I, I think this... Their motion called a lot of attention to posts that people would not even have noticed or paid attention to otherwise. And perhaps instead of monitoring uh, the service formerly known as Twitter for potentially insulting posts about Koberger, their time would be better served going through the discovery more closely. Yeah, doing anything else. 
you know, going to get lunch, frankly. I mean, we've learned through Delphi that sometimes you can feel that the internet, you know, is really important. And oh my gosh, this person's saying that on Reddit, or this person said this in the YouTube comments. But what you learn quickly is most normal people don't care at all. And don't watch that stuff and don't look at that stuff. It's it's better to just let it go pretty much because most of the time it's not that important. It just seems important to people in a very specific online space. Now, again, I, that's upsetting. I, I don't think people should be posting stuff like that, but it's minuscule in the scheme of things. And also, if the chief anchor of, you know, Whoever, you know, whatever anchor is doing the predominant coverage on Fox News was posting that. OK, maybe I can see an argument there. That's kind of creepy and inappropriate. And maybe that shows that the media is being underhanded. But if it's some random person taking a perfectly normal screenshot and then zooming in on something weird, that's not really the media's fault. That's some person doing that. And they don't have does not sound like they have a huge platform. So. Not does not seem like a huge deal. Also, I think it's important to keep in mind that those of us who do get on Twitter and notice these things, as I often do, I say Twitter, of course, it's now known as X. <laughs> those of us who do get on X, uh, you, you see some tweets and stuff, and maybe you have a, a laugh at someone's expense, but then you go on with your day, and generally speaking, the tweets that you saw earlier in the day or you tweets you may have seen yesterday or last week are completely out of your mind. Yeah, but it's, it, and it's also just like the, the person who posted that on X is not in the courtroom reporting on Brian Koberger. It's, it's somebody using the byproduct of the reports to do something. And I just feel like I don't think the media should be held responsible for that. I, I think if the media, I, mean, I think if someone screenshots Koberger's face and tweets out like, oh, this is a weird looking guy. He looks like a serial killer. That's not very nice. I don't think you should be making judgments based on how you feel somebody looks. But I don't think that's the media's fault. I think that's people just being people. And I don't know. It it just seems like they're focusing a lot on this that in a way that I think just kind of undermines some of what they're trying to say. So. Moving on to something that is perhaps much more important in terms of its connection to the case. There's been a lot of debate over DNA in this case between the prosecution and the defense. And frankly, a lot of this going back and forth is a little bit confusing to those yes. of us who aren't scientists, scientists <laughs> and don't necessarily understand all the fine details of how something like this works. Yeah, it's I'm baffled half the time. So if you know any DNA forensic people, let us know. Um, but we've been trying to follow it just based on how the legal arguments are playing out. And this was a recent filing from the Latah County Prosecutor's Office on this topic. At the hearing on the state's motion for protective order and defendant's third motion to compel held on August 18th, 2023, the court allowed the state to reverse cross-examine two witnesses, Gabriella Vargas, who the defense disclosed without CV the day before the hearing, and Leah Larkin, for whom the defense disclosed PowerPoint presentation for the first time during her direct examination. The state has determined that it need not cross-examine either of these witnesses. Vargas and Larkin were two uh, DNA experts for the defense. The prosecution is noting here that they were not essentially, it sounds like they're in accusing the defense of not properly disclosing some of it and maybe even, I would say, springing it on them. But then... Ann Taylor at that hearing, according to WFMZ, had some accusations to lob back at the prosecution. She said that Vargas was interrogated about her testimony by two FBI agents and said that that impacted Koberger's rights. So in this filing, this recent filing from the prosecution, they said that they have an explanation for that and we're going to show the court why that happened. But those exhibits are under seal. So we, the public, don't don't know what went on with that or what exactly happened. But the court now knows. But one really interesting thing for me in this filing is that the prosecution also filed a transcript from not this case, but another case that they say includes a similar ruling or a ruling that they feel is applicable on the DNA issue in this case. So... This is a one-time cold case that authorities now say has been solved, and they've actually filed charges 
in this case. This involves a nine-year-old girl named Darylin Johnson, who disappeared all the way back on February 24th, 1982, as she was walking to school. She was sexually assaulted and suffered blunt force injuries. Her body was found next to Snake River. And it was decades later that DNA uh, linked a man named David Dalrymple to this case. This case is a double tragedy because not only did a family lose their nine-year-old daughter, according to KTVB, they, there was also a wrongful conviction as a result of this. Uh, a man named Charles Fain was convicted of her murder. Charles Fain was released from death row in 2001. And this is also kind of a triple tragedy because during the period when uh, Mr. Dalrymple was free and not behind bars for this, he was actually committing other crimes. And in fact, he actually committed another sexual assault. Yes, and was convicted in 2004, I believe, or it was a 2004 assault around there. Yeah. So he victimized other children as a result of this. But in 2020, investigators circle back around to him based on DNA. So what does this have to do with the Idaho case? Essentially, the prosecutor in the Idaho case in the University of Idaho murders is saying, hey, look how this was handled in Canyon County. And cites transcript from that case of the prosecutors and the defense attorneys and the judge in that case talking about DNA and talking about what the prosecution should disclose as part of discovery versus what they so so to. are you saying that the, the process of dna whatever you want to call it they used in this case is similar to the process of dna used in the yes. idaho case investigative gene genetic genealogy is what they're talking about so they're saying look at how it was handled here what the prosecution did what they turned over to the defense and what they did not turn over and let's see if we can do something similar in this case. Yes. Is that what they're saying? That is what they're saying. And we'll read a little bit of the transcript just to give you a flavor of what was discussed and perhaps a better explanation of how investigative genetic genealogy works as far as the prosecution is concerned. So the speaker here is Sean Jorgensen for the Canyon County Prosecutor's Office in Idaho. We are offering to the court our understanding of this investigative practice. So with that, what is investigative genetic genealogy? I would begin by noting that I am not a scientist. This information that we are proffering to the court is a really broad, overarching layman's perspective, an understanding of what this DNA profile is and what was done with it with respect to the genealogy part of the investigation. So I begin first by noting the difference between STR and SNP or SNP in the context of DNA science. Now, STR stands for short tandem repeat. When we think of DNA evidence, just colloquially, culturally, that is generally what we're talking about, is this short tandem repeat profile that is obtained from a sample of DNA at a crime scene and is then screened through the CODIS database. So what short tandem repeat is, is a technique that has been, again, according to my understanding, has been developed by DNA scientists over the course of decades. And the purpose of it is basically to identify the portions of the genome where we see the greatest variability. So human beings, just as a species, share approximately 99.9% .9 of their DNA. So STR is a technique that is designed to get to that 0.01% or approximately a million points of data from the DNA. So the genome has approximately a billion. STR looks at a million specific points. And those are taken from particular loci or locations along the various chromosomes. STR looks at specific points and it compares those for variability. And from that, scientists are able to gain probability estimates to link a sample to a suspect. A SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. Now, in STR, these variability points, they're summarized in letters T's, A's, C's, and G's. Each one of those is a SNP. In cases such as this, where the genetic material that was found at the crime scene, or in this case found in the victim's underwear, in this case it was a hair, that particular hair may not contain enough genetic information to get an entire STR profile. That was the case in this case. And so when the state sent the hair that was tested by Dr. Green to his lab at UC Santa Cruz, 
What Dr. Green's methodology is, is to use his proprietary and developed method to extract essentially every SNP that he can find from that hair. Every single nucleotide polymorphism that he can extract, he extracts. Now, again, that doesn't necessarily give him enough for an STR profile. But what it did do in this case is it enabled him to create a SNP profile that can be used for genealogical purposes. Now, what we're talking about with a SNP profile for genealogical purposes is ultimately really the same thing that we're now familiar with in our common everyday culture with things such as Ancestry.com. For example, I myself got an Ancestry.com profile for me. I had a spit in a little tube. You send your spit off, they make a SNP profile, and they upload it into their database. And that's precisely what investigative genetic genealogy is. So this SNF profile that Dr. Green developed from his testing of that hair, an investigator updated that profile into a genealogical database, just as you would with Ancestry.com or 23andMe, something along those lines. In this case particularly, as we noted in Chambers, the investigator was affiliated with the FBI. And then the database, whatever database they use, that is a private company, a private third party. And so the state, the state does not have any information from that private third party or from the FBI that we could tender to the defense at this time. We're not certain we could get it if we were ordered to by the court to try. But the point we want to make is that regardless of the court's ruling, that this was simply an investigative technique that was aimed at trying to find a suspect. And again, it's not going to be used at trial because the whole purpose of it is simply to identify potential suspects. Once a genealogist constructs a family tree and identifies a particular family line that may be connected, to again, that hair from which the SNP profile was derived, it is incumbent on law enforcement to then find their own independent evidence to investigate those individuals to determine whether there is actual reason to believe any of them may have committed this crime. It's purely investigative. It's purely for a lead or a tip to give investigators a potential avenue to investigate the suspect, again, independently. And so that is why we're not introducing it at trial. It was just an investigation. It was It is not substantive evidence, and that, again, is why we believe it is not discoverable. Jorgensen went on to clarify a few things about STR, noting that uh, it involves the genotyping of allele length at defined loci along, along these chromosomes. So he was getting very specific. Judge Whitney followed up by asking if genealogy. And this was the layman's version. This was the layman's version. Let, let's before we, we move on, let's try to oh, God. dumb this down for me so I can. I don't this. I don't think I can dumb it down. I I'm I'm too dumb for this. I'm too dumb. I'm so dumb with science. It's embarrassing. So I kind so, of get what they're saying. So if if I understand it, they're, they're saying basically when we do this sort of DNA testing, correct me if I'm wrong, we can I- identify that, oh, this particular uh, DNA belongs to someone in the Kane family. Oh, no. And so then they say, okay, let's look at everybody in the Kane family. And then investigators with that information look at everybody in the Kane family, and they have a particular suspect, Anya, and their subsequent investigative work uncovers evidence implicating Anya specifically. And so the defense would be saying, well, we want the names of everybody else in the Kane family who might share this same family tree and not just my nuclear family but like everyone in the branch of you know the entire thing i think is what they're saying so is is this am i correct with this i believe you are and the prosecution is saying well there's really no point in that because these other people just happen to be related to anya unlike anya there's not evidence tying them to the crime also they're noting that we are not doing our case based on we got a genealogical match that is a tip. That is something where we're like, we're going to look into Anya. But if we get Anya's DNA and it doesn't match, we're done. That's it. Because it didn't match. And if we if it does match, we can't just go based on that. We have to get the specific match to the STR profile. And we have to get evidence. Did she have an alibi for the crime? What else was happening? So they're basically saying this is a springboard for us. It's not the platform that we're landing upon, ultimately, when it comes to the case. So 
I don't know if this is, I'm going to just be honest, because we're so out of our depth with this, and we're going to try to find some DNA scientists or some people who can speak to this on our program. But what, and and I actually have somebody in mind who I think we're going to ask, but my feeling is that in the Idaho murders case, the prosecution is almost characterizing the defense as asking for everything, asking for the entire genealogical tree, identifying Koberger's relatives who may not even know that they're relatives with him and like, you know, maybe a huge expansive part of this genealogical database. And there are privacy concerns with that for the private companies and and just for the people involved. And what I what comes to mind for me is it's as if a co- company had a CCTV camera on the side of their wall and it picked up a crime. And the defense wanted not just the footage and maybe not just the footage from the, from the entire day, but they wanted that company's like bank records, everyone who worked there and all that because they were like, maybe the police are colluding with them. It seems to me that's what the prosecution is indicating the defense is doing. It, it may be, it's like, let's say there is a CCTV camera and it picks up a lot of people in a crowd over the course of a day. Yeah. And investigators conclude that someone in that crowd committed the crime. And scientists find evidence that, oh, look, one person in this crowd is carrying a smoking gun. Let's focus on them. And the defense says, well, that that's very interesting, but we want the names and addresses of everybody who appears in this camera footage. Yeah, it almost seems to be a, a, an attempt in this situation to maybe force an issue over DNA, genetic genealogy, privacy, whatnot, in a bid to protect Koberger kind of forced into a wider debate. Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting issue. It doesn't sound like the identity of these other people whose names may have come up in the process. It doesn't sound like that's terribly relevant. relevant. But whenever there's new advances in science, the courts have to grapple with how to handle it. And the fact that this issue came up in an earlier case in Idaho shows that this this is an issue that's going to keep on coming up. And it will probably be quite a while before courts come up with a solid game plan. This is how we always handle it. Jorgensen also noted that because they were working with the FBI and because there's a third party lab involved, they don't have the genetic genealogy tree. Like that's not something that the prosecution has in their possession. All they're getting is the SNP profile and things specifically related to their case. So he's basically saying, if you tell us that we have to get this, we can try, but I don't know if they'll give it to us. Oh, that, that's also interesting as to another interesting process question. Why shouldn't the investigators have access to some of that information? I, I, I would think that if I had like a state police lab doing ballistic tests and I'm a prosecutor, I would have access to all of that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know the but, answer. But I get there's no obviously no privacy concerns in the identities of individual guns. Is there? No, are? there aren't. Yeah, exactly. So these these are very these issues are not unique to the Idaho case. No, Kohlberger's defense attorneys are not uniquely contriving these issues. These issues are out there, and courts are trying to figure out how to handle them. I think that's fair to say. And this one one sort of moment what happened when Judge Whitney asked if the Basically, he wanted to boil it down. So basically, he's asking. So what he's asking is, are, are the genealogical databases that were used to narrow down the search for law enforcement, but not specifically to identify Dalrymple as the suspect? And to that prosecutor, Theodore Lagerwell said yes, that he had accurate, accurately described that. And so the idea that it's basically local law enforcement uses the genetic, the investigative genetic genealogy to identified the Dalrymple family line, and then investigation ultimately identifies Dalrymple as their prime suspect. So defense attorney in the defense attorney for Dalrymple in this case was Gabriel McCarthy. And he kind of noted that he wasn't really sure what the controversy was. And he was basically like, as I mean, he was he was like, as long as you guys turn over everything that you have in discovery, 
and I be- and noted that he believed that they had complied with the discovery. He didn't see what the problem was. And he did not have an objection to the court entering an order as long as it preserves the disclosure of the scope of the discovery. At the same time, he didn't really want to preemptively say that, uh, you know, stop the state from taking affirmative action. So he he indicated the defense doesn't know what it doesn't know. So he didn't really like the hearing. He didn't really want the ruling done on that level. And what Judge Whitney ultimately did was he ordered that the state was, quote, not obligated to disclose any genealogical database not in its possession. He declined to order that they're not required to disclose any information relating to the use of investigative genetic genealogy because the defense needs and must get copies of what you actually get, such as the report, even though I understand it's not your intention to introduce it at trial. So he basically said, give them everything you have. If you don't have it in your possession, that's understandable. And before we move on to our our next case, I I also want to stress that the privacy concerns of the people whose names come up in this are very real. Many people don't know everybody they are related to. I happen to be adopted. And so it would be uh, quite a shock if my name came up in some sort of court case because uh, a biological relative of mine who I've never even met and don't know anything about uh, was somehow involved in a crime. Exactly. And we know that, unfortunately, people who get associated with true crime cases can be harassed. They can be stalked. There can be negative repercussions to them. So it, it does seem like a relevant issue that they're talking about. Um you know, given that Kevin and I are not scientists, just just keep that in mind when we're talking about this. We're trying to be honest about what we don't quite understand or don't quite fully feel comfortable talking about. And and this is one of them. And this is one of those things. So rest assured, we will be reaching out to some folks to perhaps come in and discuss the various issues raised here and perhaps answer some questions that Kevin and I have as well as that you might have about this process. We've covered the University of Idaho murders quite a lot. Now we're going to talk about a case that we've never covered before. This is the case of Joshua and Kayla Farmer. And this happened fairly recently in the town of Fishers, Indiana. If you're not familiar with the area, Fishers is a northern suburb of Indianapolis. Specifically, this happened at the Speedway gas station located on the 7200 block of East 116th Street in Fishers. Unfortunately, this took place right right near a daycare. And we looked through the probable cause affidavit filed by Detective Jonathan Dossie of the Fishers Police Department. So the PCA describes that on June 28th, 2023, around 519 p.m., Fisher's PD got a call from this gas station. They heard that shots were fired. When they arrived, they found a maroon town and country van, and it was riddled with bullets. There was a white female sitting in the driver's seat who had been shot to death. She'd been shot multiple times. And they saw that BMV records showed the car belonged to a woman named Kayla Farmer, and the ID in her purse confirmed that identity. So Detective Dossie scopes out the crime scene. He's seeing glass everywhere. He's seeing the car shot up. He's seeing the injuries to Kayla. Workers from the Speedway showed him the vehicle of Kayla driving up. And then they see an orange or maroon Kia Soul drive in. The windows are tinted, so you can't initially see who this is. They see an arm reach out. There's a nine-second pause as the cars are sort of near each other. The person in the Kia drives away, comes back. 19 seconds later, stops at the front bumper. The windshield glass starts spraying around with the town and country van. And then another time they come back to the driver's side of the maroon van. So basically they, so what they saw was, so what they saw was the perpetrator in the Kia driving by and shooting up the car in three different instances. So a very, very targeted situation very cold and calculated act very very cold 
investigators looked up Kayla and found through the Hamilton County reporting system, there was a case with the Noblesville Police Department. On May 26th of that year of this year, a preliminary report of alleged child abuse or neglect was created. And this was regarding a battery that apparently occurred on May 21st. So we're, I'm going to read a little bit from the PCA, which we've edited a bit for clarity. Both Kayla Farmer and Joshua Farmer were listed along with three children unknown in the heading. In summary, the report indicated Kayla and Joshua were recently divorced. It stated Kayla, referred to as mother in the report, was always wearing makeup to cover up bruising from Joshua, the father referred to in the report. Additionally, it stated on Wednesday the father put a gun to mother's head and that the children were believed to be home when this occurs. The report's source was listed as anonymous. On June 1st, 2023, Officer H. Allen with MPD was assigned further investigation of the DCS 310 based investigation. Three forensic interviews took place at the Cherish Center in Noblesville with juvenile witness 1, 11 years old, juvenile witness 2, 6 years old, and juvenile witness 3, 4 years old. Juvenile witness 1 stated his father Joshua used his shoulder to force juvenile witness 1 into a nearby chair after an argument between juvenile witness 1 and his brothers over a toy. This then caused an argument between Joshua and Kayla, his mother. Juvenile witness 1 reported hearing Joshua tell Kayla that she was going to learn today. At that point, Joshua began to choke and punch Kayla before ripping her clothes off. Juvenile Witness 1 told the interviewer that Joshua held a gun to Juvenile Witness 1's head and used the end of the barrel to push his head down. Joshua was then alleged to have asked Kayla to choose between herself and Juvenile Witness 1. Juvenile Witness 3 reported witnessing Kayla's shirt get ripped off by Joshua and that Kayla's neck was bleeding from being hit choked. Kayla, during a subsequent interview, confirmed she had been battered by Joshua on the occasion Juvenile Witness 1 and Juvenile Witness 3 referred to in their interviews. She also disclosed Joshua had held a gun to both her and Juvenile Witness 1's head. Subsequently, a search warrant and Laird Law warrant were obtained for the shared farmer residence. The warrants were served, but Joshua was not located and neither was the gun mentioned in the victim's statements. Officer Allen also submitted a probable cause affidavit requesting criminal charges be filed against Joshua Farmer. So Joshua Farmer, after that, was charged with multiple counts around the battery and an arrest warrant for him was filed June 5th, but he fled. He was hiding from law enforcement during this time. Noblesville Police Department was actively looking for him, but he was you know, staying underground, essentially. Now let's get back to the PCA for Kayla Farmer's murder. During the initial investigation, investigators learned that a female named Stephanie Hale called Hamilton County Dispatch and stated Joshua Alexander Farmer is the shooter and would be turning himself in. Hale further stated to dispatch that she just spoke with Farmer on the telephone, but he would not provide his location. Hale stated that prior to speaking with Farmer today, she had she has not spoken to him since last week when they met at a Walmart in Muncie, Indiana. Hale advised that they have not dated for approximately four months. Hale stated that Farmer called her from the phone number ending in redacted. During the phone call with Hale, she began the conversation asking if the female victim at the scene was Kayla Farmer. Hale mentioned that at the scene was a minivan with car seats in the back. Hale stated that during the phone call with Farmer, he stated that he loved her and that there had been an incident today. Farmer described his life events involving Kayla and his family over the last few weeks. He, Hale stated that Farmer advised her that Kayla accused him of battering her, and she took the kids away from him. Hale stated that she advised Farmer to contact his attorney and turn himself in. Farmer then advised Hale that he was on foot and walking to an unknown police department. Hale stated that Farmer told her that he was trying to get a hold of Kayla, but she didn't answer the phone. Hale stated that Farmer then told her that he took care of it. Hale then asked what that meant. She stated that Farmer's reply was, we don't need to get into that. Hale advised Farmer stated that he saw Kayla at 116th Street in Allisonville at the gas station when she got off work and I took care of it. Hale stated that she then began reading information being released about this incident. 
Other details from the PCA include that construction workers at the historic Eller house across the street heard the shots, a number of different witnesses. One of the witnesses tried to help Kayla and ran over and saw that she was not responsive, just twitching after the shooting. On June 29th, 2023, Detective Dossie went to the Hamilton County morgue for the autopsy. Kayla had sustained over 15 gunshot wounds. So Fishers, Noblesville, and the Indiana State Police team up to begin surveilling. And at some point, they're surveilling the area of Massachusetts Avenue and 10th Street in Indianapolis. And it's a bit confusing from the PCA, but one of the detectives sees a person's shoes in a, in a growth of shrubs. They end up going over there and they find Joshua Farmer. He's handcuffed and arrested without incident. This is a really horrible case. Just an absolutely horrible case of, of domestic abuse, you know, just resulting in this situation. I just want to say I feel really bad for Kayla Farmer's family and especially these three kids ha having to go through this, losing their mother in such a situation and, and having, I don't know, it's just horrible. It is a horrible case. And the prosecutor of Hamilton County, Indiana, which is where this crime occurred, is certainly taking it seriously as they've announced they're going to seek the death penalty. Yes, Prosecutor J. Greg Garrison, who is the prosecuting attorney for Hamilton County, has asked that Joshua Alexander Farmer be sentenced to death. And he's citing the following Indiana Code section, 35529, in support thereof. And here are what he argues are the aggravating circumstances that are present here. One, the defendant committed the murder by intentionally discharging firearm from vehicle. Two, the victim of the murder was listed by the state or known by the defendant to be a witness against the defendant, and the defendant committed the murder with the intent to prevent the person from testifying. The first element of that, I, I suppose that's meant to discourage drive-by shootings. Yeah. The second perhaps is more significant. I believe that in situations where perpetrators kill witnesses against them, the state takes that more seriously because it's an assault on not only the person who's been murdered, but the justice system itself. They want to really disincentivize people from killing witnesses. Yes. So when that happens, that's taken very seriously. Because the system doesn't work if people are afraid to testify. If people are afraid to testify or people are threatening. We've heard about plenty of cases where people have been threatened over being witnesses in a case. And in this situation, unfortunately, it resulted in the death of a, a mother of three. Uh, a jury trial in this case is scheduled to begin in early November. And we will keep an eye on it. And thanks so much to the listener who recommended looking at that one. It's a very difficult case to read about, but domestic violence is an absolute scourge. And I think people need to be aware of how, how horrible things can get here with that topic. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet Discussion Group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.